Uh, we, we were just setting up for a live shot. Just this very live shot location, the rain pouring down. We're trying to warn people about the water on the roads and the water in the ravines when we heard a sound. But yes, we do consume each other's blood on occasion for ritual purposes. War with China. War feared a dictator like Vladimir Putin. Kid yourself. That's called World War III. Uh, industrial revolution is, it doesn't change what you are doing, it changes you. Pope Francis has been rated as the world's best leader. This is according to Gallup International Annual Global Survey conducted in 55 countries. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to a series understanding what? World events. And tonight we're going to look at this very important subject, the coming Democrat and Republican conspiracy. And just another note, as before, there are many issues we can spend time with, but my goal is to see the bigger picture. So I will not engage with partisan politics. Therefore, try not to listen to this message with your political filters on. At times it may appear I am leaning towards one side and at other times towards the other side. I'm not. These lectures will not be political, but biblical and prophetic. And regarding tonight's message, I use the term Democrat and Republican as illustration in my topic description. I'm going to look at secularism and religion tonight as the two main ideologies in our time. But I'm not confirming or confining a political party into one category here. You can make up your own mind as we go along. I'm not going to do that for you. And as we have seen in Scripture, the Bible says there is a warning message from God sent to this planet just before Jesus comes. And it is symbolized by three angels flying in mid-air. Now the Bible says concerning these messages, Revelation 14, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. They followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations do what? Drink. Drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Tonight we're going to see how she, according to prophecy, Babylon will make all nations drink. Everyone will come together. Now you will see a pattern as we move from one subject to another. All of this is connected. Can you see this already? Every little thing we are studying in prophecy is connected. And so as we saw last night, the global agenda of the world with Agenda 2030, we can clearly see the Bible is going to show us that all the nations will just drink whatever is served to them. And tonight we will see this with our own eyes. Now I need to just share with you the story as a backdrop to what we're going to study tonight. For 2,000 years, Europe are divided by war. Hmm, that is still the fact. 
It can be traced back to a single battle in the Tudorberg forest of Germany. It is called the Varian Disaster, a battle led by a German Roman army officer, Arminius. His dad sold him to the Romans for their own freedom, and he was raised as a Roman officer, and eventually he then shifted sides to take sides with his own German people. Now, Arminius deceived Rome and united the Germanic tribes. They set a trap for Rome on their own turf and slaughtered three legions in Germany's forest. Now, you need to know that was like a death blow to Rome. They only had a few legions, and with that, their main army was gone overnight. This caused a rift between the Romanic and Germanic people. The rift is still a reality today, as the EU tries to heal itself without much success. At that point, total Romanization were totally stopped in these areas as Rome withdrew. This was a turning point. A what? A turning point in history. Just like the Germanic rulers, Napoleon and Hitler almost succeeded to unite Europe but failed. Why did they fail? Because God is in control. God is holding the winds, as Scripture says, and God caused division to prevent global dominion. Do you see that? God caused what? Division in order to prevent global dominion. Now the scripture says in Revelation chapter 7, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Can you see tonight that God is holding the winds, the winds of strife, the winds of war? Because God is ultimately in control. Now the Bible talks about the time of the end. And tonight we're going to see the time of the end begins with a very specific event. And why we need to know it? Because we're going to study a prophecy and it starts with the time of the end. And in order to understand that, we, know to, we need to know when did the time of the end start. Now let's go back in Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel. Daniel says in chapter 12, 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. This is now the angel speaking to Daniel. And seal the book even till when? To the time of the end. So do we find in Bible prophecy that there's a term, the time of the end? Yes. Let's make very sure. Don't confuse it with end time. Okay? It's the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now when is this time of the end? Daniel 12, 5 goes on. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two. The one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. He's trying to understand what's going on. And one said to the man clothed in linen, there's the third being, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now the question we need to answer is, the man with the answer is the man clothed in linen. Now who is this man clothed in linen? Let's go to Daniel 10. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in what? Linen. Linen. Is this the same man? Yes, it's the same man. Daniel 10, 11, 12 is all part of the same vision with one angel explaining this to Daniel. Whose loins, now this is the man being described, the man in linen, this is him being described. Whose loins, Daniel sees him in vision. Whose loins were girded with fine gold of Ufaz. His body also was like the beryl. His face is the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire. His arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now we find almost the exact same picture in Revelation. 
John sees in vision on the Isle of Patmos, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Guess what? The Bible says Daniel fell almost like dead too when he saw him. Same consequence. So here's Daniel equated with, with John what both of them saw. It's the same. Daniel sees a certain man. John sees the son of man. Daniel sees clothed in linen. John sees him clothed with a garment. Daniel sees him loins with, girded with fine gold of Ufaz. John sees gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Daniel sees his face as the appearance of lightning. John sees his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Daniel sees his eyes as lamps of fire. John sees his eyes were as a flame of fire. Daniel sees his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. John sees his feet like unto fine brass. Daniel sees and hears the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. John sees and hears his voice as the sound of many waters. Is this the same being? It's absolutely the same being. This is Jesus Christ. Now what about this Jesus Christ? Now please listen. Daniel hears the angel asking the Son of God, Jesus Christ, because he has the answer. And one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen. Who's giving the answer tonight? Jesus Christ. Who holds the answer for our questions? Jesus Christ which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swore by him that liveth forever that it shall be for what? A time, times and and half. That sounds familiar. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now please listen to this last part. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, that he is the Antichrist, scattering the holy people. We, how would we know all these things shall be finished? At the end thereof, this will be the time period ended, which will mean the time of the end. Let me show you Daniel 7.25, the same type of wording. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Can you see? He's persecuting the saints and think to change times and laws. They shall be given into his hand until when? Until the ending of a time and times and the dividing of time. And we already did that study. That is prophetic time. And we discovered that in prophetic time, pro a prophetic day equals one literal year. So a time in Bible prophecy is a year. Times is two years, a half a time is half a year. That's how they calculate those days. And so that means it's 1,260 prophetic days, which means 1,260 years. And so this is the exact same time period we found earlier. What happened that we see at the end of that time period? Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed, and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. And so here the Pope was captured, and the Bible predicted in Revelation, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to what? To death. Here he was captured, and his reign came to an end in 1798 at the end of this 1260-year period. Which means, when does the time of the end start? According to Bible prophecy, 1798, we are living in the time of the end since 1798. Now with that said, we can look at time over, <laughs> over Scripture's Bible you know, chronology and we can see, wow. 
So here we have this a massive period of a thou, more than a thousand years, and at the end of that 1260-year period, we have the time of the end starting. We don't have a date for the end, but we know that we are in that phase leading up to the very end. And so here is Jesus displayed in all of this, and that just gives us this assurance that the glorified incarnate Christ is in control of time, amen? And therefore, world events. He shows us he has everything in his hands. Just listen to Daniel 7.25 again. This is the Antichrist. Shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Listen now. And they, that is God's people, shall be given into his hand until. Question. Can you see that even persecution is in the hands of Jesus? That he has a cut off date. You will only be allowed to persecute them until this date. Can you see that? And even in this, he says, I am with you to the end of the age. Even in the persecution, he's with his people. You can clearly see Christ is in control. Now we see Revelation 13, 3 says the deadly wound will be healed. But even in his last period of this revived papacy and antichrist ruling, the Bible says in Revelation 7 and 10, and when he cometh, he must continue a what? A short space because God is controlling it and Jesus at the right time will cut it off. He won't allow a world empire. So, just to give you an overview, Daniel, in every prophecy in the book of Daniel, it works in apocalyptic way, which means by recapitulation. Every prophecy has more detail than the preceding one and is painting the picture more and fully and more complete. Daniel 2, we already did Daniel 2, and we covered that whole prophecy. You remember that? Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Europe, second coming. You remember that? That was the image. We saw that. Then we covered Daniel chapter 7. Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, divided Greece, Rome. There was more detail, divided Europe, and the Antichrist. We didn't cover the judgment, second coming that time. There's too much info in Daniel 7. And tonight, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 11. That is one vision, Daniel 10 to 12, where the Antichrist and the atheism structure. Now, the others, we will, we will touch on the others at a later stage in this week and, and the following week. But here, I want you to focus and to see that this is all still part of the biblical prophetic pattern that is in scripture. It follows the exact same pattern, Media Persia, Greece, divided Greece, Rome, Messiah, divided Europe, and then it comes to Antichrist. And tonight there's something added, atheism or secularism. Can you see that? Okay. So that is where we are headed. So the event that starts the time of the end. Okay, so we saw an event concluding by the time of the end, and that event was the papal reign of the Antichrist. Did you, did you see that? Okay, for 1,260 years. And so if you didn't have the previous lectures, if you were not here, please get those because we covered and studied those. Now the event that starts the time of the end, this we find in Daniel chapter 11, 40. Listen to the words as it starts out. And at the what? At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, we don't have time to do the whole prophecy of Daniel 11. If I talk very fast, uh, I will do it in precisely 60 minutes, but it's a, a quite complicated prophecy. But it starts with the exact same flow as I showed you earlier. Let me just go back. Exact same flow of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, etc. And what you see is when it starts off, it starts off with the king of the south, king of the north, king of the south. And when it starts off, basically the king of the south is Egypt. And then eventually it moves on through all these empires through time, and it comes to the Antichrist and secularism or atheism, but it still uses the same terminology, king of the south, king of the north. And when you study it, and you equate it with the other prophecies, you clearly can see what this king of the south is and what it means. But in order to understand that, and just so that you don't think I'm thumb-sucking this tonight, I just want to ask this question. What happened in the run-up 
to 1798. There was something happening in Europe. Anyone knows? The French Revolution. So there was a lot of revolt, a lot of rebellion, especially against the church. But it was highlighted in a specific period of time, in November 24, 1793 to June 18, 1797, when they basically banned the Bible, uh, closed church doors, basically banned religion, the use of God's name, no singing, no Jesus' name, nowhere for that period of time, as you can see it there on the screen. Now, what did the Bible say about this? The Bible predicted this very French revolution. In, in Revelation chapter 11, it says in verse 8, And their dead bodies, speaking about the two witnesses, meaning the Old and New Testament, that because Jesus says, These are they which testify of me. It's the word of God. And so the, the, the French basically killed the Bible. They banned the book, and it was burned on the street. And the Bible says, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spirit is called Sodom and what? Egypt. Okay? Where also our Lord was crucified. And so here Jesus was an open display crucified, rejected, dejected. It was just crazy what was going on. If I go back quickly here on this picture. This is the original picture. Um, it's, it's a long history. But this was the woman or the goddess of reason. Uh, they had her through the streets and we will only worship reason. And so she was this goddess of reason. Well, look where her foot is. On what do you see her foot stepping? That is Jesus on the cross. And so she's basically stepping on it. And so that's exactly what the Bible said. Uh, our Lord will be crucified in the streets of this whole thing going on, this revolution. Now, please note, Egypt, okay? Then the Bible goes on in verse 9, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Question, in prophetic time, how long is three days and a half? Three and a half years. Didn't we just see that historically? The Bible was banned. Churches closed for three and a half years historically in France during this time. And shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They were openly mocked during this time. Now the Bible says they were spiritually Egypt. What does that mean? When we go back to Egypt in Scripture, Exodus 5, the Bible says, And Pharaoh said to Moses, Who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice to let Israel go, I know not the Lord. He's basically saying, I don't know such a Lord. I don't think there is such a Lord. There's no God but me. Neither will I let Israel go. That was a plain atheistic statement. There's no Yahweh. I don't see, no believe in any Yahweh. Atheistic. So Egypt means atheism. And what has happened here, this is the power of secularism, humanism, uh, uh, atheism being bred up by the French Revolution. And since that day, we are faced with this just greater threat than ever before to Bible-believing Christians. Now, you see this calendar. They changed the calendar during the French Revolution. Okay, this was the new calendar. They replaced the Gregorian calendar with a French revolutionary calendar. There were 12 months divided into three 10-day weeks, each ending in a day of festivity. Question, why did they ban the seven-day week cycle? Because it only comes from the Bible. There's no scientific explanation for the seven day. You can explain 30 days with the moon, anything you can explain. You can you explain day and night scientifically. You can't explain seven days to a calendar. And so they knew it, and that's why they said, we will reject this, and we will go to a 10-day calendar. Um, each day was split into how many hours? 10 hours. Every hour into 100 minutes, and each minute lasted 100 seconds. The remaining five or six complementary days needed to match the solar year were placed at the end of the 12th month. This was based on the calendar used by what? The ancient Egyptians. Can you see? Spiritually, Egypt. They rejected God, and they, they were trying to go back as the Egyptians was before. Now, let me go back to the prophecy. Now, we have a little bit of background. At the time of the end, that is 1798, shall the king of the south push at him. Did 
secularism, atheism rise to push at religion, at the church. Yes, the prophecy is correct. So we can clearly see the king of the south, that is what it is, secularism, atheism, all of that. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. And eventually we, shall, we see the church reacting to this. Uh, with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So who is the king of the south in the time of the end? Let me just spell this out. This is godlessness, lawlessness, atheism, communism, evolutionism, secularism, liberal, anti-Bible, anti-God movement. Whatever you want to term it tonight, that is what it is, even in our time, because this prophecy is playing off before our very eyes. Um, the world has gone crazy. Can we please get God out of religion, the Daily Beast asks. And the whole article is going on and how religion is hurting us and hurting society. We should get rid of religion. The debate.org is a big, big site uh, uh, globally, especially in this country. And, and here's the thing. U.S. motto in God we trust. Should the United States get rid of the motto in God we trust? Guess how many people voted yes? 60%. We should get rid of the motto in God we trust. Because we cannot have that part of our country. Then lawsuit demands U.S. remove in God we trust from money. And so now there's a lawsuit because we should get rid of the word in God we trust on our money. A new lawsuit filed on behalf of several atheist plaintiffs argues the phrase in God we trust on U.S. money is unconstitutional and calls for the government to get rid of it. Just craziness. Then tomorrow's gods. What is the future of religion? Now, on, <laughs> this is just crazy. Uh, this guy's explaining, one notorious answer comes from Voltaire, the 18th century French polymath who wrote, he was an atheist, some say he was agnostic, I think he was an atheist, if God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. Because Voltaire was a transient critic of organized religion, this quip is often quoted cynically, but in fact he was perfectly sincere. He was arguing that belief in God is necessary for society to function, even if he didn't approve of the monopoly the church held over that belief. And then this guy concludes, many modern students of religion agree that religion is the opium of the masses, basically in quoting Karl Marx, that people only have religion because they need a crutch to lean on. But if you really go and look, there's no God. Religion does not make sense. New York Times, just a few months ago this year, in this time of war, I propose where we do what? We give up God. We get rid of God. This author writes, Shalom Auslander, this weekend Jews around the world will celebrate the holiday of Passover, the name of which comes from the story of God passing over the homes of our distant ancestors on his way to slaughter the firstborn sons of evil Egyptians. Then he concludes, in this time of war and violence, of oppression and suffering, I propose we pass over something else, God. Full stop. This is where the world has come to. In Time Magazine, regular Christians are no longer welcome in American culture. And they explain how many Christians feel no more welcome in their own country. And then this guy says on this website, let's just ban the Bible. He even has now, a, a, he's, he has now litigation going on trying to get all the Bibles banned still, that is still in any school or any school library. Just craziness. Only Sky, this is an atheist site. This is written by an atheist. Um, he's not too far from here. The future of American religion. Christians will finally be in the minority. With the newest polls coming out by 2050, it will be in the minority. He's just celebrating. It, at last, Christianity is shrinking. Craziness. That is the king of the south. Now, who is the king of the north in the time of the end? It's religion, friends, under control of the papacy and supported by the USA. Um, sad to say, but this is what the Bible describes. And if you have attended last night, you have seen this global agenda. And who will push the agenda? Uh, it will be papacy supported by the U.S. government. That would be the police study. And we've looked at that last night. If you've missed the lecture, please get the lecture. 
Uh, Revelation 13 prophesies about this in verse 11 and 12, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. We identified this as the United States. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Originally, this was a Christian-like nation with Christian values and principles, but now it is speaking as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to do what? To worship. Is this a religion issue? Yes. To worship the first beast. Question who did we identify as the first beast out of the sea? The papacy, whose deadly wound was healed. That's just crazy. Now we can just see this over history. You all remember when the wall fell of communism in East Germany. Time magazine says how, how Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. And the title is Holy Alliance. I will call that an unholy alliance. A pope and a president. How the two powers brought down communism. And guess what? As secularism, atheism, communism, socialism, anything you want to call it, is rising again, these two powers will again stand against it, and it will win, according to Bible prophecy. And that is why the king of the north or religion says it's time to put God back in this house. Fight, keep Bibles in school. This is now just the opposite again. Uh, Hoover Institution says the moral basis of a free society. Now a lot of this makes sense, except if you take it too far. They say when the government of China tells people they can read state-run newspapers but not print and distribute Bibles, imprisoning and torturing dissenters, or have one child but not two, forcing women to have abortions, or watch state-run television but not listen to Radio Free Asia, jamming broadcast signals and threatening students, that is not freedom. If, later on in the article they say, can the liberties of a nation... Be sure, when we remove the only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people, that these liberties are the gift of God, as Thomas Jefferson, or as John Adams put it, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. A verse, ambition, revenge, or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. But they are taking this out of context to the extent where, of course, you need to govern yourself. That is the very point of John Adams. You can't govern someone's heart. That is his point. But what the, the statement or the argument people these days are making is that, oh no, everyone should be what? If you look at that word, moral and religious, everyone should now be Christians. If you're not a Christian, the constitution can't apply to you or you can't be a good citizen. That is how people apply it these days. And that is very dangerous. Um, is God being expelled from American society? And this makes really sense. Currently, through the ban of separation of church and state and political correctness, many institutions have succeeded in removing God from the essence of our American society. It is my belief that the American majority needs to speak up, stand up, and demand moral changes in our government and institutions alike. Absolutely, they should be changed. But here's the problem. What is the problem? This banner of separation of church and state Okay, they want this gone, which means that this church will control the state. Question, where did we see before the church controlling the state in history? Ah, 1260 years long, the church controlled the state. And millions were persecuted, millions were tortured, millions died. That is what happened. But now Christians are sensing this as a persecution. Well, please explain Just listen this to the words. Kolakovic moment. I, I know you mentioned it in your book. What is it? Why do you think it's happening here in America? Right. Well, Father Tomislav Kolakovic was a Croatian priest in the 1940s doing anti-Nazi underground work in Zagreb. He got a tip that the Gestapo was coming for him, so he escaped the country and went and hid out in neighboring Slovakia, his mother's homeland. 
When he arrived there in 1943, he began to teach in the Catholic University. He told his students, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the communists are going to be ruling this country when the war is over. The first thing they're going to do is come after the church. We have got to be ready for it. I firmly believe that we are in a similar moment here in America now. Christians of all kinds, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, have got to take advantage of this moment of liberty we have to get our networks in place to prepare for persecution. And so here is the one, this is the one viewpoint where people are preparing for persecution. The other viewpoint is on the other extreme again of Christians now of religion, we have a biblical duty, we are called by God to conquer this country. This is now the other extreme. We are going to take the government and we're going to make it a Christian government. Pat Robertson said, we have enough votes to run the country. Then Rushduni said, the only true order is founded on biblical law. All laws religious in nature and every non-biblical law order represents an anti-Christian religion. And so his solution is that Christian law, he means biblical law, should be applied in government and everyone should follow Christian law. Do you know what we call that? We call that a theocracy. We call that exactly the same what happened during the Middle and Dark Ages where the church ruled the state. Now that is very dangerous because who is going to then can interpret the Bible for you? Because with so many churches we all interpret it differently. Who's going to make the call to interpret the Bible and the Bible law? The first and basic duty of the state is to further the kingdom of God by recognizing the sovereignty of God and His word and confirming itself to the law word of God. The state thus has a duty to be Christian. Do you hear that? It must be Christian even as man, the family, the church, the school and all things else must be Christian. To hold otherwise is to assert the death of God in the sphere of the state. And so his solution to this rising secularism and atheism, whatever you want to call it, is that we should mandate Christian law in government to all people and everyone should obey otherwise God is going to die in our society is that the biblical way you see here's the problem God gave us law so for instance we have ten commandments do you know the first four commandments no one can tell you what to do with the first four it's between you and who God no one can tell you but they don't differentiate between this, okay? The last six is between you and mankind, which means, yes, the state can enforce that. The state can say, don't steal, don't kill, don't do this. But the state can not tell you how to worship. Uh, listen to We need a government of Christians. Listen very carefully. He says, we need a government of Christians. We need a government of Christians. We need a conservative movement, a nationalist movement led by Christians that obey the Bible and obey God and serve Jesus Christ. That sounds good, but what is the end? What is his conclusion about this? Listen to this. We want to live in a Christian country with Christian rulers and Christian legislators and Christian judges and Christian law and Christians. So everything should be Christian. But here's the problem. Who's going to interpret what Christian? What Christian? Who's Christian? I'm going to tell you what Christian. I'm going to show you, don't miss next week the mark of the beast. It's going to be Catholic. It's going to be immediately back to the dark ages. The Bible prophesied. It's on my thinking. It's what the Bible says. And you're going to see it now here tonight. So listen to this. The Bible says, Daniel 11:40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. What does this mean? Let's just break this down. At the time of the end shall the king of the south. So we identify that as lawlessness, atheism, communism, evolutionism, secularism, liberal, etc. And the king of the north, who's that? That's the revived papacy with the U.S. And that is religion, just religion. I'm not talking about the relationship with Jesus, just religion, a garb of religion. Shall come against him like whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen. That is military might. And with many ships, that's economic might. And he shall enter into the countries, that is all the non-Christian countries, and shall overflow and pass over. That is media, force, philosophy, whatever you want to call it, just to get everyone to go along. 
Because, oh, I'm, not, I'm not even showing tonight. That same people I just showed you on the screen, the, they say in other places, we want the, to Christianize the whole world and that the whole world should be ruled by Christian law. Which means this prophecy is going to get true in our very time where the king of the north is going to be stronger and everyone is going to be forced into this one religion. That is craziness. Daniel eleven forty one 41 says, He shall enter also into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, he shall enter, that is the revived papacy, the religion, into the glorious land. And in, in, now in apocalyptic prophecy, that is the church, that is Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, Ammon, go and read that scriptures. Isaiah, Amos, and Acts. And you will see these are other faiths that are converting to Christianity. But they keep on to true Christianity and they are not being manipulated or forced by the revived papacy. So this is all going to come true in our lifetime. And then the prophecy goes on in Daniel eleven forty two: 42. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Question, who was the land of Egypt in this prophecy? King of the South, secularism, humanism, whatever you want to call it. Oh, so that will not escape. So what does that mean? So he is the revived papacy. The countries, as anyone who opposes him, will be persuaded to work together. Egypt, that's the king of the south, that is secularism, shall not escape, which means will be persuaded to join forces with religion. And here will be this joining alliance between Believe it or not, secularism and religion. We are, at the moment, everything is divided. It's polarized like never before. The Bible says that it's going to come together. And you're going to ask this question, I have the same question. How on earth is this possible? How will secularism be persuaded to join hands with the religion? There's a Bible answer to this. And uh, just listen to this. And he... This is now the second beast of the United States working for the papacy. He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Can you see what's going to happen? Miracles, signs, wonders to such an extent that people will go along because it's like, oh wow, something is supernaturally happening. Don't miss tomorrow night. If there's anything you miss, don't miss tomorrow night. We're going to deal with a coming false religious deception. It's, it's just going to be crazy, 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 crazy. So then you will see why it is going to happen. It's just going to make sense. But let's go on with the prophecy. Daniel eleven forty three says, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the previous precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Now, we know that the dollar is the mighty dollar in the world. Some say it's going to fall. I'm telling you, it's actually getting stronger. You can see with the pound, the euro, as everything is getting worse in the world, the dollar is getting stronger. Don't miss next week. We're going to see what they're busy with with the dollar, and you will see, oh, wow, America's currency is the global power. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And the Bible says that no man might buy or sell. This is the power of the United States, of course, to the papacy, but of the United States, and it will control the whole world economically, exactly as the prophecy says, which means it will be the controlling factor regarding money globally. So that prophecy makes sense in Daniel 11. Then verse 44 says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Guess what? There's a message, there's tidings out of the east, out of the north, that disturbs this power. Guess what message that may be? That is the message of God's last warning we find in Revelation 14, portrayed by three angels flying. This very message I'm preaching to you and sharing with you now is 
going to upset this system to such an extent because it's unmasked. Its whole work is displayed before everyone to see and everyone can make a choice. And it will just cause havoc. The message of Revelation 14 shakes the foundations of Babylon and upsets the revived papacy. It causes global persecution and it's going to be literally a hell of a time. But God will be with his people. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, speaking about the end time, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Because you, you're speaking God's truth, God's message. But God is still in control. But here we have reality today. Is the country divided? Is the world polarized? I wonder why. I wonder why. Who is ultimately behind this division? Now, when we go back to Babel, the, the Tower of Babel, we started last night. Remember, God said, go to, let us go down there. Confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Who divided the builders of Babel? Oh, it was God. Do you know it's God's mercy that there's this division currently? Because by this, God is holding the winds. By this, God is giving us an opportunity to know His truth, to share with others, that we can be, be prepared for the things laying ahead as we saw it last night in the previous evening. The Bible says, And He shall plant the tabernacles of His palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Oh, wow. He's going to make His mark and set up His boundary. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. That is the conclusion of that prophecy. Now that holy mountain, according to Psalm 48, Christ is the true king of the north, of the holy mountain. He is the king of the north. Do you remember Lucifer, who wanted to be the king of the north, setting up his throne in the mountain? Remember that? In Isaiah 14, 13, the exact same motive throughout all the ages, trying to set up a global empire. And eventually it's going to look like he's succeeding. It's a global empire. The world is wandering after the beast like Revelation 13.3 says. And he's getting what he wants. But God is not going to allow him. The prophecy says he will come to his end. So who's the he? It's revived papacy. The tabernacles of his palace. That's government law. That is the mark of the beast. Don't miss the mark of the beast. We, I, will go, I will expose the whole thing. Then between the seas, that means it's global, it's everywhere. In the glorious holy mountain, that's God's people, that's Israel, that's God's church. It will be forced, and they will need to make a choice between the mark. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. God will destroy this power after his people stood for truth. That is what the Bible tells us. So, in summary with this, Satan, through the Antichrist system of the revived papacy, will eventually try to establish and enforce his government and law globally and try to break God's people, that only he can reign. But this system will be broken instead by God. Amen? Absolutely. Jesus, my friend, is in control of world events, and he will not let this global system stand. It's impossible. That is why the Bible says, when the winds blow, God is in control. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Beloved, it's going to get hectic out there in the world, and it's going to feel like you're going to be blown away from your foundation spiritually. No, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seed of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, and saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. God is going to make an end of things, and God says, I'm going to keep it until my people are sealed. I will study this in the future lecture. So what does the Bible say about this? Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the world for a witness unto all nations. And what? Amen. Then shall the end come. Please note, who's holding the winds? Who's making sure that uh, all their plans are not coming to climax until God's work is done? Jesus Christ. Which means, if it says, 
and then shall the end come. You remember last night it says agenda 2030? That is not giving us any date, just to make sure everyone understands that. God is going to keep the winds, and God can decide before the time, after the time, whenever, uh, in His time. The world or Satan or the Antichrist can never determine when. Only God can then. Can you see that? It's in Jesus Christ's hand, in no one else's. That is why the message to the world says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. When this goes to everyone, what happens when Jesus is ready? When he says, okay, my work is done. What happens? Just a few verses later. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. I want to ask you tonight, do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Can you determine when he comes? No, it's, everything is in his hands. Can Satan determine it? No, it's in Christ's hand. And he will determine when he comes. And when he comes, no one will stop him. And he will make an end to all this nonsense going on in this world. We are in for a rough ride. But praise the Lord, God has been with his people through all the ages. And we can rest assured that we are in the hands of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? That's wonderful news. So tonight... You know, the simple question is, what side do you choose? The unholy alliance that's going to set up this whole global system? Or will you go with Jesus' truth? That's a dividing truth. You know why it's a dividing truth? Hebrews 4.12 says, My word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces, and it goes in, and it rips asunder, and it shows the motives, the heart, the character, the mind. This is what we need. You know, when we, when we look at world events in ourselves, we get blown away, m thrown away, moved along with all the feelings and emotions. But when we study God's Word, God dispels all this noise and mist, and He shows us the truth. What truth? The truth about ourselves. Where do I stand? Do I stand on the rock, Jesus Christ? Or do I just go along with what seems right in the eyes of man? My friend, I pray that God will help us to stand with the truth of God, even if He divides, even if it divides my family, even if it divides things in my mind, or it's too uncomfortable. I will stand with the truth of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you want to do that, just pray with me tonight as I end with prayer. Father, in everyone's heart tonight, I just pray that we'll make that commitment for the truth of Jesus Christ. Even if it divides, even if it's uncomfortable and it, and it pierces my soul, may I accept it because it's healing, it's truth. Oh, Father, as we see what prophecy says about an unholy alliance, about what's going to transpire in our time, oh, Father, I just pray that you will be gracious to all of us to stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ that we will study your word and make sure we are not deceived and not to go along with this worldly global system. Oh, Father, keep our eyes on Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.